Hello darlings, welcome back to my channel. My name is Anja. You are watching Hey Anja Girl and honey, I just really, really, really need to know. Is everybody healthy? Fantastic. Ah, uh, the spa. A place we look to for relaxation, rejuvenation, and self-care of the mind, body, and spirits. Spas have a long history across the globe. But for the purpose of this video, we'll focus on the spas of the Western world. Have you ever wondered where the concept of a spa came from? There are so many theories as to how this wonderful concept came about. Some say it comes from the Latin phrases sanita per aquam or solas per aqua, both of which mean healing through water. Another theory is that it derives from the Walloon word spa meaning fountain, which is the name of the town spa in Belgium. Regardless of what train of thought it originated from, I for one am so glad it came to be. In this video, I'm going to talk about the history and evolution of the spa, which we have all come to love. So to all of my history buffs and those who just like to be knowing things, come on and enjoy. But before we can even talk about spas, we'd have to talk about its daddy, the bath. We all know that a bath or bathing refers to immersing oneself or something or someone else into a fluid for the purposes of becoming clean or for relaxation. So here's our first vocabulary word, balneotherapy. Balneotherapy is using bathing to treat disease from water rich in minerals from a mineral spring. Just in case you've never heard of a mineral spring water, this water is rich in salts, sulfur, compounds, and gases from underground. So it's that good, good stuff. People often confuse balneotherapy with hydrotherapy. Hydrotherapy, formerly called hydropathy, is a sector of alternative medicine that uses water for pain relief. The key here is that one is a mineral bath specifically used to treat disease, and the other is not. While we're at it, let's throw in one more term because we like words, right? The lasso therapy. This one is the therapeutic use of seawater. Okay, back to the history. In order for us to appreciate anything that is beauty and wellness focused, we look to and thank ancient Kemet or the ancient Egyptians as the Greeks called them. This extremely advanced civilization paved the way for what we know today as the beauty industry. Personal hygiene was of extremely high cultural value to the Egyptians because, well, of course, cleanliness was next to godliness. The ancient Egyptians were one of the first civilizations to use bathing, not only to keep the body clean, but also as an experience of luxury. It was the Egyptians who inspired the Greeks' bathing practices and hygiene. Now in the Greeks, Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, suggested that perspiring, walking, massage, and bathing were all important to maintain balance within the body as the cause of disease is centered around imbalance in the body. According to Greek mythology, the Greek goddess Artemis was the first to discover the healing powers of hot mineral springs or tidal pools. Spartan warriors believed that the pools were blessed by the gods for curing diseases, so the Greeks used a variety of baths. One in particular was the steam bath. In the Book of Bath, written by Francois de Bonneville, he wrote that in 6th century BC, Greece, Bathing was ritualized, becoming an art of cleansing sands, hot water, hot air and dark vaulted vapor baths, a cooling plunge and a rub down with aromatic oils. This describes our exact concept of the modern day spa, you guys. It excites me so much. The Greeks also used natural add-ons such as juniper branches, fir, pine, and bay laurel to add therapeutic essences to enhance the bathing experience. 
but there was a group of people who had to outdo the Greeks. The Romans. Now the Romans were credited for raising bathing to a high art. Think of everything the Greeks were doing and then some. Bathing in Rome was a big deal, especially because Roman soldiers regularly treated themselves to the curative baths when they were wounded from war. In Rome, there were three types of baths. You had the Balnea, which was a bath at home, Balnea Privata, which was a private bath, and Balnea Publica, which were state-funded public baths. The aqueducts in Rome had enough water for each bather to use 1,400 liters per day. The Balnea Publicas were also called Thermae, which were similar to the steam baths of Greece. They were large, complex, communal bathhouses where soldiers could rest, relax, and recoup. These thermes were built around hot thermal springs, which made them a lot more resort-like. The structures themselves were expansive, you guys. A small therme could hold about 300 people, while a large one could accommodate between mm, three to 6,000 bathers. Men and women had separate bathrooms, with men having the larger rooms because more men frequented the baths. So let's talk about their structure and formatting. They were built with granite and decorated with marble mosaics, frescoes, and massive domes. These were not cheap by any means. And the Romans developed a system for their bathing patrons. You would come in, start off in the apoditarium or the changing room. The first phase is the frigidarium or the cold room. Plunge in the icy bath, then retreat to the tepidarium or the relaxing warm room. This prepared the body for the caldarium or the hot room. After this cycle, you could either get massaged with oils and your skin scraped with a strigil, which was a curved piece of metal, or start the cycle all over again. People, this was big business. I'm saying that big business deals were going down here, important legislative discussions were taking place at these thermes. You just didn't go to a therme to get clean. Romans would spend entire afternoons socializing, eating, receiving treatments, exercising, napping, and being entertained. As the Roman Empire expanded, the soldiers introduced their bathing practices to new conquered territories in France, England, Germany, Austria, and Hungary. In fact, you can still visit some of the historic Roman baths today in Bath, England, although please don't try and swim in them. The difference between the Greeks and the Romans were that the Greeks saw spas as medicinal and healing to the body, and Romans viewed spas as relaxing and for recreation. But as the Roman Empire fell in 476 AD, so did the bathing culture. Christianity was on the rise, and people focused more on finding cures through prayer and worship than medicinal baths. Spas had also gotten a bad rap for the lewd acts that patrons started getting into. This lasted for hundreds of years, but in the 1300s, mineral baths would soon become in vogue again. In 1326, an iron master named Colin Le Loup from Liège, Belgium, discovered the Calibiet Springs in the forest town of Spa in eastern Belgium. Today, that would be about an hour and a half drive away from Brussels. Because the springs in that town were so rich in minerals, a health resort was built there. And in fact, in 1717, Russia's Emperor Peter the Great made them famous when he was cured of liver disease from visiting the springs. Add to that, 16th century physicians started prescribing drinking mineral water and taking mineral baths to their patients to cure disease. The patients would bathe in warm water for up to 10 hours a day, starting in the morning till the afternoon, while drinking the water for several days. The goal was to do this cycle until skin pustules formed on the skin, then burst and drained. They would follow this with a hot mineral bath. This resurgence of mineral bathing once again put the focus on the healing properties of mineral baths for health and wellness. Balneotherapy, hydropathy, and all of those fabulous natural treatments of the past were truly on the rise again. By the Elizabethan era, European spas looked back to the Roman era for the infrastructure of their new spas. 
Y'all remember that term, the lasso therapy? Well, the well-to-do or anyone who lived or could afford to get to a coastal town got the benefits of all that delicious seawater on their skin. People who had no idea of the benefits of seawater before now clamored to get to it. Forever young, darling. Forever young. Minds were changing again about how amazing baths, treatments, and spas were for their way of life. Everything was well except spa sanitation was not up to par. In 1842, there was a cholera epidemic that sprung out in England, which led to the Baths and Wash Houses Act of 1846 to 1896. But that took care of that. And Americans wanted in on the luxury as well. In 1761, the Gentleman's Pool House in Warm Springs, Virginia was built. This place was counted as the oldest spa building in America. European travelers were used to spas at home and wanted in on those benefits while traveling. They learned the Native American cold and hot springs could give them the same benefits that the mineral springs did in Europe. They were able to find these springs in Connecticut, Pennsylvania, New York, and Virginia. By the 18th century, everybody was sold on spas. Physicians wrote them as prescriptions left and right. This was the budding of the health resort industry in the United States. The first popular luxury spa in America was built in Saratoga Springs in New York in 1815. This one was modeled after a Grecian spa. It was grand with 500 plus rooms for visitors, two large four-story buildings, ballrooms, the works. Actually, by the 1800s, spas and resorts were popping up all over the states that surrounded hot and cold springs. Golfing, hunting, horseback riding, all the jazz. And the building of railroads made it easier for people to get to them. Spas were here to stay, honey. 20th century spas were still the bee's knees. Of course, there were critics who claimed that the spring water wasn't any more special or beneficial than warm tap water. But this only encouraged spa owners to create treatments that would pamper their patrons and entice them even more. And pampering people received. All sorts of spas were popping up. In fact, the first day spa was known as Manhattan's Red Door, introduced by beauty maven Elizabeth Arden in 1910. And spa culture has grown and grown and grown and grown to what we know and love today. So next time you're indulging your tootsies or opening your pores with steam, thank all of those civilizations who came before you and simply say, ah.